Okay, we're going to try for the third time. But uh, it's Tuesday, November the 22nd. A couple of days from now, it'll be Thanksgiving. We don't want to lose focus with the fact that we've done, I don't know how many, lots and lots and lots, though, of COVID briefings. You know, there is a tremendous level of sadness and respect that we ought to give all those, all those that have lost loved ones. Since the last time I was with you, we've lost 33 more great West Virginians. I ask for that same respect and love and sadness in every way for these great families, all these people's loved ones and everything, and, and for the fact that we've lost 33 more unbelievably great West Virginians. Absolutely, at a time of Thanksgiving, it's going to be tough on these folks, so please keep them in your prayers. The 7,558th death is a 71-year-old female from Boone County. The 7,559th death, a 93-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 7,560th death, an 85-year-old female from Logan County. The 7,561st death, a 79-year-old female from Wetzel County. The 7,562nd death, an 82-year-old female from Morgan County. The 7,563rd death, an 85-year-old male from Wayne County. The 7,564th death, a 67-year-old male from Cabell County. The 7,565th death, a 94-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 7,566th death, a 91-year-old female from Wyoming County. The 7,567th death, a 93-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 7,568th death, a 77-year-old male from Boone County. The 7,569th death, a 72-year-old male from Lincoln County. The 7,570th death, an 89-year-old male from Clay County. The 7,571st death, a 94-year-old female from Brooke County. The 7,572nd death, a 73-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 7,573rd death, a 71-year-old male from Harrison County. The 7,574th death, a 50-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 7,575th death, a 100-year-old female from Cabell County. And God bless her in every way, and thank you for her wisdom. The 7,576th death, a 69-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 7,577th death, an 87-year-old female from Roan County. The 7,578th death, an 89-year-old male from Raleigh County. The 7,579th death, a 90-year-old male from Gilmer County. The 7,580th death, a 54-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 7,581st death, a 70-year-old female from Jefferson County. The 7,582nd death and a 72-year-old female from Jackson County. The 7,583rd death, a 73-year-old male from Wood County. The 7,584th death, a 58-year-old female from Putnam County. The 7,585th death, a 69-year-old male from Mingo County. The 7,586th death, a 96-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 7,587th death, a 90-year-old male from Clay County. The 7,588th death, a 73-year-old female from Randolph County. The 7,589th death, an 83-year-old male from Randolph County. And the 7,590th death in West Virginia is a 92-year-old male from Mongahalia County. Active cases, we have 637, 206 new positive cases. The daily positivity rate is at 4.87. Our cumulative positive rate is at 8.53. Recovered cases in West Virginia are 604,689. I do not have the number that is ho are hospitalized. I, I can only speculate, maybe Dr. Marsh has got this, but I think that it's somewhere just barely north of 150. And, uh, and you can see most of all of our counties are green and just with, with just a few yellow counties. And so as far as the map goes, the map, I mean, the map it looks pretty dead gum good. 
you know, we'd like it to all be green. We'd sure like it, this thing to all be gone. But with all that being said, I, I, you know, I've told you over and over and over and over, we can live with this. We can live with this through vaccinations, through boosters, and absolutely we can do that, you know, but, uh, but it's not gone. And it's not going to be gone, in my opinion, for a long time. And the winter's upon us. I remind you over and over about your booster shots. Absolutely, you can see by the, by the detail, I'd say the average age of all these folks was 70. You know, with all that being said, if you're 50 and older and you don't get your booster shot, you're being really silly and, uh, and taking a heck of a chance. You know, I, I really encourage all to get your vaccines and get your booster shots and everything. And, uh, and I absolutely encourage you all about your flu shot. You know, I got to my flu shot the other day. And, uh, and, and so I absolutely, you know, no side effects, no nothing. You know, not even a sore arm. I mean, come on. You know, we got to, we've got to get these vaccines. From the standpoint of the numbers, the numbers... Uh, are continuing to look better and better, slowly but surely. We get more and more and more people vaccinated, more and more people with your, you know, booster shots. The vaccine calculator is on our website. If you'll go on, register and everything, it'll help you, you know, be, notify you as to when your vaccines are due or when your boosters are due. Any information about COVID is on our website and our, you know, on our COVID vaccine line. Uh, there's 35 outbreaks in the long-term care facilities, none in the church community, 61 inmates, and 18 staff cases. The Homeowners Assistance Program is still available to you. If you'll call, there's a good chance we can get you qualified. If we get you qualified, you'll put some real money in your pocket. From the standpoint of giving blood, check with your physician. Please consider doing so. The Red Cross really needs you. We all need you. From the standpoint of yesterday was the opening day of uh, the firearms, uh, you know, on our buck deer, deer in West Virginia. It's a, you know, it's a tradition, you know, that is unbelievable. I encourage everybody to get outside, but I absolutely encourage you with all in me to be super safe. Handling a high-powered rifle is absolutely something that you really need to take very, very seriously. Watch what you're doing. Especially watch what you're doing if you're crossing a fence or if you're, you know, absolutely close, you know, please, please, you know, minimize in every way, you know, exposure and be just one step safer. It doesn't hurt anything for you to tell your loved ones, whether they be older or younger and everything about safety all the time. Safety, safety, safety. You can enjoy this incredible state. And the beauty beyond belief that will touch your soul, as I've said so many times, I am a lifetime hunter in every way. Absolutely, with all in me, be safe, enjoy the goodness and everything, and just absolutely take care. And, and you know, if you've got kids out there, teach your kids. Teach your kids first and foremost, you know, hunter safety. You know, the, the tourism group, uh, you know, is, is, has got this big buck photo contest going. You know, send in your pictures and everything. There's all kinds of different divisions and everything and, and that you can qualify in. And, uh, and you may be a big winner. You may be a big winner of a lifetime hunting license and everything. It's really good stuff. And I, I congratulate, you know, Director McMillian and uh, Secretary Ruby. Great work. Just keep, just keep it going. Now, a couple of things here that are really, really dear to my heart and everything, but today I am presenting checks for $500,000 each. A total of a million dollars is going to our food banks. The Mountaineer Food Bank and the Facing Hunger Food Bank. You know, we promised this money. I promised it in my state of the state address the past two years and, and, and included it in my budget again this year. This will be the third year that we'll be able to donate these funds. As long as I'm here, we're going to continue to put things, I mean, to put this in my budget. We may very well try in every way to increase it, you know, but the bottom line of the whole thing is we don't need people going hungry in West Virginia. 
Now, I know there's a lot of people that step up and make all kinds of donations and everything, but at the end of the day, we don't need people hungry in West Virginia. I mean, that, that is so terrible, it's off the charts. So many different organizations do great, great work, and I salute them in every way. But at the end of the day, you know, if, uh, if we, you know, we've got, we've got two folks joining us. We've got Tennyson, uh, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Thornberry from the Facing Hun Hunger Food Bank and Chad Morris from Mountaineer Food Bank. And, uh, and I, I might as well go ahead and do this right now, but, uh, but guys, this is the Mountaineer Food Bank. This is our check for 500000 And this is the Facing Hunger Food Bank. And this is our check for 500000 So if Tennyson and, uh, and, and Chad had come on now, it's good stuff. And we're really proud to be able to do it. And thank you so much for all the unbelievable work you do every day. It is unflat believable how, how great these food banks are and how great the work is being done by these people and all the people with them. So come on guys, tell us, talk to us. True hunger hero and continue to support uh, the Facing Hunger Food Bank since you've been in office and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, you've entrusted resources with us to take care of our communities throughout our region and, and we just can't thank you enough for that. And it's making transformational changes in our community. So. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to accept this check. And on behalf of the food bank and those in our community, we thank you dearly. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, Jack can't be with us, so Governor, back to you. Well, again, you know, Tennyson and, and Chad, thank you so much, and uh, keep doing the great work. It, uh, you know, it's just it's just really unbelievable. I mean, that's all there's to it. And I, you know, it, it chokes me up to think about it. But, uh, you know, we've got to step up. We've got to really step up and and make sure that we don't have people in our state that are going hungry. I mean, it is, uh, and and especially at this time of year, but all times of year. You know, it is just uh, it's so 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 important. But thank y'all in every way. God bless you. I salute you in every way, and thank you for all the great work you do. Okay, we got a real problem in Hinton, and it is really bizarre, but we've got a sinkhole in Hinton that just continues to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, we're probably going to lose, you know, uh, our police station there, you know, and, uh, but, but this is, uh, you know, we have, we have been on this, and people have, have come up with solutions and everything else under the sun, and, and then we get... A terrible rain event, you know, like you know that we got from. I think it was Hurricane uh, Nicole. I, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, but with all that being said, then the situation just gets, you know, where we put in something that is a temporary drain situation and it gets washed out. You know, all of this happened from a failure of a drain system that had been put put in place 90 years ago. Now. I can assure all the folks in that area, all the folks that there's absolute, all hands are on deck, they've been on deck, and, and with the DOH, and now you see the DOH is constructing and putting in place a temporary bridge there. The temporary bridge will serve absolutely as just that, a bridge that will take us to a final and complete solution to this problem. In far as, uh, as far as what the DOH is doing, I'm sure they are busting their tail. And I think really at the end of the day that this temporary bridge is 11 feet 9 inches long with overhead clearance of 13 feet 6 inches, a crew of 16 men and women from District 9 and District 10 with the WBDOH Central Forces spent most of Friday and Saturday bolting the bridge together. You know, uh, you know I, I, I know it's not the complete solution that we need, but it will surely, surely help. And, uh, and I, wanna, I wanna go back and just look at my notes here real quick and everything because this, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that we, we got the name of the company that makes these, but uh, this, this bridge that the DOH employed is a prefabricated bridge kit manufactured by the Mabry Bridge Company, and we thank them in every way, but, uh, uh, you know, 
the bridge is made up of prefab, prefabricated beams and trusses which can be assembled on site without the need of special tools or construction methods. So uh, again, lots and lots of folks are stepping up and doing what we can here and everything to alleviate a real problem. You know, the only other thing I'd like to report is, uh, you know, the permanent uh, repair bid will be completed and out before the end of the year. So, so people are working at it and everything, and, uh, and I thank them for all their hard work, and, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I hope that everyone in the area, in the area knows just uh, that everybody's trying, everybody's trying as hard as we can to, to get to some kind of solution to, to, to make everybody, keep everybody really safe, really, really safe, first and foremost. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, Governor. We have members of our coronavirus task force present as well. Let's first go to Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Read more names this morning. We are reminded that that COVID-19 is still with us and, and still mutating. So in the country today, the dominant variant is a combination of two descendants from Omicron BA5, and that is BQ1 and BQ1.1. The reason why these variants are important for all of us is because BQ1.1, which is growing the fastest, is about seven times more infectious, <clears throat> excuse me, than BA5 is, and about 175 times more infectious than the original COVID-19 virus. And the key of BQ1.1 um, is that it is evasive to all of the monoclonal antibody treatments and also is invasive to uh, parts of our immune system that are important in keeping us from being infected. And that's the reason why it's so important for people, all West Virginians, but particularly older West Virginians, to make sure that you stay current with the vaccines that you're supposed to get, and certainly the vaccine calculator can do that. We know that in the United States today, about 88 to 91 percent of people dying in the most recent surge in August were, um, were over uh, 65 years old. And as we've seen the pandemic evolve, that number was has been historically, if you look at the whole pandemic, around 73% of people dying from COVID-19 have been over 65 years old. So the age of our populace in our country and the age of the people the governor read this morning are actually getting older. And we know that only about 29% of our over 65-year-old population in the U.S., have gotten their most recent COVID booster shot. And in West Virginia, we know that we have a older, sicker population. So we are very concerned about the potential impact of this new variant coming to West Virginia. And our most recent sequencing run in West Virginia, only about 6% of the cases were from the BQ1.1 virus. And so we know that West Virginia is always a bit behind other parts of the country. And this gives us a really important window to make sure that we are taking advantage of, of being up to date with our COVID booster shot. The most recent Omicron booster shot seems to be more effective against this new variant than any other shot that we've had. And also, we want to remind people to get your flu shot as well, because we're starting to see the flu start to spike in West Virginia. So we anticipate in the next week or two, the BQ1.1 will be our dominant variant. And again, remember, much more infectious. And although in fully vaccinated people, it is not seen to be as severe as some of the previous versions of the virus, but in unvaccinated people or not up-to-date vaccinated people, then this COVID-19 variant can still cause a big problem. The governor referred to our bed situation, and today we have 120 
uh, inpatient uh, hospitalized uh, people with COVID-19, 16 in the ICU and seven on ventilators. So this is a time to act and avoid having really severe manifestations, particularly with the holidays coming up that are really happy times for us to celebrate. But as you are looking at big gatherings, and if you're vulnerable, particularly if you've not been up to date vaccinated, please take this opportunity to do that. And remember, if you do get symptoms and sneezing can be one of the new symptoms of this new variant that you wanna test yourself and really at any age, you wanna contact your healthcare worker so that you can get prescribed Paxlovid. Paxlovid is the antiviral medication. And we've seen from a big study from the VA that there is a 26% reduction in the risk of long COVID from taking Paxlovid for the five days. And we want to use that effectively, particularly in older people. And lastly, I'd like to congratulate and thank Tennyson and Chad for their service and for the food bank service to our great state. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Marsh. Let's now go to retired Major General Jim Hoyer, our Director of Joint Interagency Task Force. To uh, uh, put a little bit of different perspective on what the governor and Dr. Marsh have talked about, and Clay pointed out uh, most recently, 91% of the deaths in our country have been over age 65. The governor has consistently pushed us to to continue to work with people in West Virginia over 50, but particularly over 65. And while our numbers have been good, they are not as strong for the Omicron booster as we need them to be. And just to put that in a little bit different perspective, 7,590 West Virginians uh, that we've lost. If you look at our county populations, there are six counties in West Virginia that are 7,601 uh, West Virginia citizens or below. So in 11 more uh, lost citizens in our state, we will have lost the equivalent of Pleasance County, West Virginia to Omicron deaths and primarily older West Virginians. So we've got to continue to press as the governor points out to get our older West Virginians, that Omicron booster continue to work uh, but while the, the, the numbers are particularly tragic and are not numbers that we want, I would say that, uh, Governor, thanks to you, your pandemic leadership team, people and our nurses, doctors, hospitals, uh, all the health departments, uh, our food banks, VOAD, all the various players uh, who have been involved across the spectrum uh, in this pandemic response for the past uh, two plus years, had we not had that leadership uh, that you've provided and those various organizations have provided, we probably would have lost the equivalent of several counties in West Virginia. So on this uh, Thanksgiving holiday week, I am thankful for the work that all of those organizations and all the people in West Virginia, uh, your uh, your leadership and the executive branch, the legislative branch, everyone who's been involved in this uh, uh, to continue to try to mitigate this threat. Thank you. All right, thank you, General Hoyer. We will now turn to members of the media for questions. Let's first start with Charles Young of WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Um, Governor, you know, in, in the last couple of days, Riley Moore has announced his uh, candidacy for Congress. Um, Alex Mooney did so last week. The attorney generals put out the letter kind of indicating his plans. I know you've um, you know, been asked several times about your 2024 and beyond plans. Have you given that any more thought now that these races are starting to shake up and are these candidates affecting your thinking? Thank you. Well, Charles, they're not affecting my thinking at all. Uh, you know, from a standpoint of, of being, you know, it being in serious, serious, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, of attention on my mind, you know, I absolutely without any question, I'm, I'm really thinking really hard about it. I'm very seriously considering running for Senate. Uh, you know, I have not made a final decision yet, you know, but, uh, but I promise you, irregardless to whatever I do, I'll be your governor the next two years. 
I'm not going to sit around and just hang out. You know, I don't believe in that. And I'll be your governor. I'll work just as hard as I did, you know, on Amendment 2 and on and on and on. But, uh, but Charles, I'm, uh, you know, as, as far as what others do, uh, you know, I wish them the best in every way. You know, uh, I, I truly believe that uh, the people of the great state of West Virginia are with me and whatever decision I make, I'm sure they'll be right with me as, as they know without any question I'll be right with them. And so with all that being said, you know, a lot of, a lot of thinking and, uh, and planning and everything and discussion go ongoing with my family and lots of folks, but uh, serious, serious consideration, you know, so, so uh, we'll, you'll know real soon. Thank you, Charles. All right, thank you, Charles. Let's now go to Stephen Adams of Ogden Newspapers. We're going to move on. Sorry about that. Let's go to Randy Yoey of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Good morning, everybody. Randy Yoey here from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Governor, many West Virginia Republicans are promoting various forms of non-traditional education as more than just giving families more choices. <clears throat> Yesterday, State Treasurer Riley Moore made an indirect reference to public education as indoctrination. I'm wondering what your position is on all this and how is this promotion a positive step in improving educational outcomes and better preparing our youth to thrive in a modern workforce? Well, first of all, you know, I, I hadn't heard that, that comment, you know, as of yet and everything. And, and I, would, uh, I would say this, you know, we first and foremost need to give people choice. And, and you know, from the standpoint of the HOPE scholarship, we still, we still don't really have... Uh, a great, great resolution for those families. We've got 3,000 families, you know, that are hanging in, 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 in the wings right now. And even, even though that, uh, that, that, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court, which, which I, you know, I condone in every way, they just said that, uh, you know, the Hope Scholarship, you know, was constitutional and, uh, and, and what, what is going on there. But nevertheless, let me get right to the point. And here's, here's how I believe and how I think wholeheartedly. I believe without any question we should be giving our kids, you know, choice. We should give our parents choice. Absolutely. Without any question. It will, the competition level, whether it be charter or private or public, the competition level will make us better. Now, we all know we've got, we've got holes in the bucket and we need to, you know, and things we need to do on a national basis, on a state basis, from an education standpoint. We need to absolutely be sure that our kids are taught, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic first and foremost. But with all that being said, let me just say this. I do not think that it is constructive in any way for us to throw rocks. You know, we can absolutely make things better. But absolutely... Probably every last one of us that's casting a rock went through the public school system. You know, so, and I'm a believer in our public school system, and I congratulate all the good work that's going on in our public schools and everything. But at the same time, I want choice, and I want competition. I want things to be better, but I'm not going to sit back and throw rocks. I'm absolutely not going to do that at all, because I'm in the schools all the time. I mean, for crying out loud, I'm in the schools all the time, you know, you know, being a coach. And I, I, I absolutely encourage any and other, any and all public officials and everything, if you could spend some time with the kids, and whether it be a coach or whatever, or some, you know, mentor or something in communities and schools or whatever it may be, go do it. Go do it. It will really, really, really help our kids, whether it be private or public or charter. It doesn't matter to me. Go spend some time with our kids. Instead of just sitting on the sidelines talking about it, go spend some time with the kids and pull the rope. Pull the rope. Our kids really need it, really need all of us right now. All right. Thank you, Randy. Let's now go to Mark Curtis with Next Media. 
Good morning, Governor and uh, cabinet members and fellow reporters. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Uh, Governor, it occurs to me that we are just about six weeks away from the legislative session. I'm wondering if your staff has got a bill drafted and has a sponsor to introduce the bill in the legislature, in the House and the Senate, to indeed create this gas uh, car tax rebate that you talked about as an alternative to Amendment 2. Just kind of walk us through where the process stands, and is that a bill that will drop on day one of the legislative session? It's already been sent to the legislature, you know, and really and truly on the very first day and the very first minutes, we ought to pass that and get rid of the car tax, period. That's all there is to it. And then right behind that, we're working on all kinds of other things, Mark, and we'll have them, we'll have them put together and put together real soon and everything that will make more, you know, uh, offer up at least more uh, avenues to get to, to, to tax reform and, and so many different other things that we've got. But without any question, we've got a momentum in this state that's second to none. We need to keep it going, don't we? That's all there is to it. Keep the momentum going is so, so important. We don't need to get in a food fight and blow our own legs off and everything. We need additional tax reform for our, for our citizens, and we can do that. And we need to find a way, really and truly, for it to be primarily, you know, from the standpoint of, of, of getting rid of our personal income tax. If absolutely we can get on that pathway, we'll drive real growth to West Virginia. We can do it. We can do it right now. We can do it together as adults with smart people in the room and figure it out, and I'll welcome that in every way, but we're working it. We're working it really hard. We'll be ready on the first day of the session. Lots of stuff going up. All right. Thank you, Mark. Let's now go to Brad McElhaney with West Virginia Metro News. Hey, Governor. Hey, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. I, I want to ask an education question, too. Uh, figures released by the State Department of Education show there are 1,544 non-certified teachers in classrooms in West Virginia this school year. That's up from about 1,200 last year and more than twice the number from 2015, not quite a decade ago, when West Virginia hired about 600 non-certified teachers. Uh, what do you think is going on and what more needs to be done to attract teachers to West Virginia classrooms? Thank you. Well, Brad, the, you know, we all know what's going on, you know, and it's going on nationwide. Really and truly, more and more and more folks are choosing uh, fields other than education. You know, we need to encourage, and we've already put programs in place, we need to do more, but absolutely we need to do anything and everything we possibly can to bring more people in the education fields. We would like all of our teachers to be certified. We don't want... We don't want kids in the classroom, you know, with non-certified folks and everything, but we want, we want people in the classrooms, and we feel like we've, we've got qualified people in the classrooms being with our kids. Now, but with all that being said, let me just say just this, Brad. At the end of the day, whether it be, I mean, you know, since I walked in the door, we've already done three 5% pay raises, the biggest amount in the history of the state. And I have introduced the fourth. We absolutely need pay that will encourage folks to come. But Brad, so many of these things, and you may think, well, this is Justice's pet peeve. I mean, look, this is West Virginia's pet peeve and West Virginia's moment. Why in the world, if we were on a pathway to significantly get or, to, or get rid of our personal income tax, do you not think that it would be a heck of a lot simpler to bring folks to to attract folks to West Virginia if you had if you were on that pathway and folks really believed that do you not think that that would be the absolute catalyst to bring people from all over the place to West Virginia we wouldn't have to worry about certifications in the people you know in the classroom we would really have instantaneously we would really have a significant growth of folks, of people in the state of West Virginia. So Brad, the answer, my answer is just really simple, just I mean, simply just this. We need to attract more folks into education. It's a field that is absolutely so gratifying and such an honor, it's off the charts. How do we do that? 
you know, we've got programs in, in place right now that we've, we've put there that are incentive programs to be able to, you know, whether it be at our universities and everything, to be able to drive folks into education and, and, and encourage them to go into education. Right behind all that and everything, we have to be really competitive wage-wise. And so with all that being said, we've got to absolutely pass my additional 5% pay raise that we have this year, and hopefully we're going to, you know, in my opinion, if we continue to do well in West Virginia, maybe we can even get another 5% before I'm gone for a total of 5, 25%, I mean, 5% raises, you know, to, that, would, that would equal 25%. That's my goal. You know, we've got to make sure that we've got PEI, you know, stable and everything. And, but the bottom line to the whole thing, you know, Brad, hands down, hands down. If we can get on a pathway of getting rid of our personal income tax in West Virginia, we aren't going to have to worry about, you know, attracting people. They're going to come. They'll come. They'll come and come and come. All right. Thank you, Brad. Finally, let's go to Sarah Sager with WSAZ. Hi, all. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, my question is for Secretary Crouch today. Um, I was wondering, last week you said you would be able to provide an update this week about uh, any changes that are going to be implemented at DHHR from the top to bottom review from the McChrystal Group. Um, are you able to talk about any of the changes or anything that's been implemented? And also, um, we're hearing that the cost of implementing those changes could be in the millions. Um, so can you give any insight into the cost of implementing the changes? Thank you. Okay, Secretary, and, and, and you know, I, I, Sarah, I'd like to add just one thing, you know, you know, the cost may very well be in the millions, but if the cost, if, if the benefit is in the tens and tens of millions, amen on the cost being in, you know, in the millions. But uh, Secretary Crouch, you can answer that way better than I. Great. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we are working hard on, the, on these changes. Uh, we will have an, announce, an announcement on Monday. Uh, probably a, a couple of announcements next week. Uh, we don't know the cost yet. Uh, the key to, to any reorganization is to get the right people in the right positions and get the team uh, that's going to move us forward at uh, DHHR. <clears throat> a lot of negative things being said again about DHHR. Listen to, to, to the positive things out there that uh, DHHR is doing. We have got tens of thousands of people every day and we have a team right now in our bureaus, best uh, commissioners uh, uh, that I've seen uh, in position. A lot of great folks who are dedicated and doing a good job. So we're going to follow the, the McChrystal report here, and we're going to make changes that uh, that I think people will be uh, as excited about as I am. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. I did say it would be this week. Uh, it will be next week, it's Thanksgiving week. So we're going to hold off on those uh, announcements until the first of the week. But we will have an announcement on Monday uh, and possibly uh, more during the week. So uh, we're, we're moving real hard on that. So thank you, Sarah. So stay tuned. Thank you. And let, come back to me just a second. You know, listen, Sarah, one thing that I, I you know, that how, how I think and, and, and exactly how I believe is. Uh, you know, sure, we've got the Thanksgiving holiday and a lot of people are out and everything. And, uh, w you know, we probably shouldn't have said we're going to announce this week and not, and, not, and not announce this week. But I'll promise you that we'll make that announcement on Monday. Okay. Governor, back to you. I would say it's just this. You know, uh, it's a time of year that we should be so grateful and so thankful to all the blessings that we have from God above, first and foremost. It's, uh, it's unbelievable where we live and all the goodness around us, all the great people of West Virginia, you know, your neighbors and everything, and just how good this incredible, incredible state really is. You know, uh, all you got to do is just open up your eyes and be fair. Just really be fair. You know, it's, uh, the beauty is unmatched. That's all there is to it. But the goodness of our people, how much they care, and how much really and truly they love, how much they appreciate, you know, it is so, so, so good. And there's so, so much to be thankful for. So please take time. Take time to do that. 
Take time to think about all these folks that are really, really suffering, whether they be hungry or really and truly whether they've lost loved ones. It is a time of year that is so, so, so precious. You know, uh, I can't thank you enough for letting me be your governor. I can't thank you enough for, for giving me the opportunity to, to lead you and, and take you on this ride with me. And, and it's, uh, it's, been, it's been an un unbelievable honor, and, uh, and I'm going to continue to I'm gonna run through the finish line. I promise you that. So uh, with all that being said, the only other thing I would say is, is just think about what the wisdom of, of Dr. Marsh and General Hoyer and all the folks, you know, whether it be Dr. Amjad or Secretary Crouch or whomever that are on, on here, but uh, think about the wisdom that, they've, that they're giving you and, and all the good stuff they're saying. You know, 29%, uh, I think Dr. Marsh said today, 29% of the 65 and older folks in this country have been vaccinated, have, been, have received their Omicron booster. Well, it's almost Thanksgiving. And really and truly, that's a big mistake. I mean, that's just all there is to it. If you're 65 and older and you can't see what's going on right here and you've already taken the time to be vaccinated up to now, you got to get that booster shot. You've got to get it. I mean, the infectious rates, the rates that Dr. Marsh talked about off the chart, you know, and think about what General Hoyer's saying. Two are great, great people. That's all there is to it. You know, saying that 91%, uh, you know, uh, you know he, he was referring to, to uh, folks that were 65 and older. And uh, it's, just, it's just unthinkable to me if you're 65 and older especially, that you've got, you've got, you know, we have 90, I think it's 91, not, well, let me, let me tell I think it's 91 or 92 percent of, of the folks that are 65 and older today that uh, it's 92.7 percent have received at least one shot. Well, for crying out loud, if we, if, if in West Virginia alone, you know, you've got 92.7% of the people that have received their vaccine at least one shot. You know, well, what in the world is holding up this nation to a level of 29% that are receiving a booster shot? We've gotten a little asleep at the wheel, and if that was all in me, I encourage you to go get that done. But more than anything, right now, at this time of year, two days from today, an incredible day to be thankful. Thank you so much for all the blessings you bestowed upon me and my family. And God bless each and every one of you. Thank you.